you have glorified our victorious Savior with a triumphant resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven, where he sits at your right hand. Grant, we ask you, that his triumphs and glories may ever shine in our eyes to make us see more clearly through his sufferings and more courageously endure our own, being assured by his example that if we endure to live and die like him for the cause of your love in ourselves and others, you will raise our dead bodies again and conforming them to his glorious body, call us above the clouds and give us possession of your everlasting kingdom. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we have had quite a week, haven't we? It's been good weather, it's been what we thought was clouds turned out to be fire. But we have things to remember as we come into faith. And I want to share uh, one, uh, Ella Berlin. Many of you remember when she was a little girl. Uh, she graduated high school this week, I believe, from Monarch. Yes. And um, Don posted on his Facebook page that She's been accepted at CU uh, in the business school, I think. Yes. As a freshman. As a freshman. Yeah. Which is yeah. amazing. I mean, she had a ways to go before. But that's uh, a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It is. I mean, yeah. Smarter than the average bear. Uh, and we had some birthdays <coughs> uh, Today, in fact, it is Pat. What a week. So, uh, I know that everybody else is here, but we got to Doris. Let her know that you're thinking of it. And uh, Belinda is giving thanks for the great virtual spiritual life retreat, uh, which we included yesterday. Uh, she led a breakout room on God's gift of laughter, including leading laughter yoga exercises. And if you don't know what that is, I think she makes house calls. <laughs> uh, and we're also giving thanks for the wonderful So What? That, that, uh, yeah, blue Room on Friday. And, and you don't have to be a sober, crafty person uh, to attend. And we're, we're taking the summer off. We'll resume in September. So you have a couple months to think of a project and if you have questions, I'm trying to think who's here that would be the most crafty person. Uh, Joanne Cooper. Suzanne. Pat. Oh. You'd be careful raising your hand. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I think it was Friday was Monday that uh, Sharon came. Sometime last week, I forget. Yeah, Thursday or Friday. Thursday. Uh, a friend of my mother's, uh, from her, when she lives in Florida, uh, came. She has family in the area, and I think it was her great niece was graduating from CU. Mm -hmm. And she happened to be passing through Boulder and stopped for like 10 minutes just to see the church. So, and Belinda was across the street scurrying around, making sure Wesley had picked up all his toys. And didn't have time. But she wanted to see where you worship. She follows on Facebook. Yes, she follows our, what we're doing here. And uh, it, was, it was, I think it was Friday that we celebrated 11 years uh, since Wesley found us uh, out underneath the bush in that church in uh, McKinney, Texas. <clears throat> we avoided the owl that night, and we 
still there the next morning, so he wandered to my office as I was packing up. And I, I found a new, something new this week. Apparently when a stray finds you, it's called a gotcha day. <laughs> he, got, he got us. <laughs> and oh, <clears throat> today, in fact, is the 285th anniversary of Charles Wesley's evangelical conversion experience. Ooh. And I put on the blog this morning uh, his journal entry for that day. Now, for John's conversion experience, which is three days later in the same year, three days later, that gets all the attention for me the Alder Gate series. John. But Charles had his three days before. And what he records about that experience mm. is, I think, instructive for all of us who are heirs of that strain of Christianity. Are there other joys or concerns that we should lift up today? <coughs> Rebecca. So both Ben and Moss, and other classmates, of course, are approaching finals, which start on Monday. Um, and so please pray for the kids and the teachers. We are in the home stretch. Yay! <laughs> and then Ben will have finished their uh, freshman year of college, which is a milestone. We're, we're very proud of them. And a few people have asked, so I'll just share while I've got the mic. Ben is going to um, spend June with my parents. So Ben's not coming home to Boulder. Ben's going to Alveston, Indiana, um, and is going to work with my dad for a while, so you won't see them for a little bit. Aww. Uh, Ron and I got some, I think will be good news this week, that he is going to be able to get the new radioactive cancer drug. And so it will be special after our visiting trip. We're pretty excited and hopeful. Good. 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 Are there others? Steve. Well, I wasn't going to say anything, but I, God's doing something in my life. My A1C is about four points. <laughs> God. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Dennis and myself have two of, have had two of our friends placed on the hospice in the last couple of weeks. So just keep families of our friends in uh, your prayers. It's the Pollock family and in the uh, Marcellus family. Mm -hmm. would, would you say those names again? Pollock. And one of us. Thank you. Are there others? Does God do anything in your life this week? Well, I thought, I thought, Amy, I thought you were going to raise your hand because it's fixing your hair. <laughs> well, I don't know if you noticed the uh, decorations around the church. Sandra did a good job as always. Mm -hmm. <coughs> adding some color to our fellowship. And this is one of those times of year where, you know, I think it was uh, one of my colleagues online said that to be a pastor is to say, now things are going to slow down until you retire. And then they'll really slow down. As you know, that's a lie. <laughs> so, you here this morning, you are a blessing just by being here. And I would give thanks to those uh, online this morning. It's, kind of, it's hard to say who's here, but <coughs> But if you're traveling this summer and, oh, be in prayer for Molly oh. and the boys. Uh, I think today they're still in Rome. What a trip. And they have had some amazing experiences already. Do you know when they're coming back? 
They get home. Ne they leave Saturday ne next Saturday. Get home Sunday. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, live vicariously through their experience. <laughs> but if you're traveling this summer, you know, please try to uh, find man? time to <coughs> join us online on Sunday morning, or if you can't, go to the YouTube channel and watch the service that way. And don't forget to comment. If you watch the YouTube, comment just you know, one line, a sentence, a paragraph, whatever you want. Just let us know that it's, it's worth doing. Seeing no other hand, I invite you to center yourself as you come before God in prayer. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, starting in verse 13, 13, must be 15. As Paul wrote this, it's a prayer that Paul wrote for the Ephesians, but this morning I want you to think about, I am praying this prayer for you. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason, I do not cease to give my thanks for you, as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe. According to the working of his great power, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head of over all things for the church, which is in his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Mm
Well, that works. Thank you, choir. In the Gospel according to Luke, or in the early manuscripts, is written Kata Lukan, or according to Luke. There, there's just a couple words of Greek that I remember, so I like to use them whenever I can. <coughs> this is what's recorded. Many others have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events which have been fulfilled among us, exactly as those happenings were passed on to us by the original eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word. I, too, have investigated everything carefully from the beginning and have decided to set down in writing for you, noble Theophilus, so that you may see how reliable the instruction was that you receive. That's how Luke begins his account of the scripture. Those words were written down sometime between 75 and 100, the year 75 to the year 100. It was written down to an unnamed or unknown otherwise unknown individual named Theophilus, which, as some of you might know, Theophilus means lover of God. So we know approximately who was written. We know from the style of Greek when it was written. But we're not entirely sure who wrote it. Now, tradition has it that Luke, a fellow worker with Paul, is the author of both this account of the gospel as well as the book of Acts, which we'll hear from in a moment. I want you to hold that thought that I just shared with you that many people have tried to write down or to explain what happened. That they tried to understand, come to a human awareness of this God that each of you here this morning claim to worship. Luke does not say this is the only understanding. He even says there are many people who have tried to explain what happened, why it happened, to whom it happened, and so forth. This is one person's attempt to explain the divine. So, he begins what is called the Acts of the Apostles. My New Testament professor called this the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. We don't know what we call it. But he begins. In my earlier account, Theophilus, I dealt with everything that Jesus had done and taught from the beginning until the day he was taken up, after having given instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After the Passion, Jesus appeared alive to the apostles, confirmed through many convincing proofs over the course of 40 days and spoke to them about the reign of God. On one occasion, Jesus told them not to leave Jerusalem. Wait, rather, for what God has promised, of which you have heard me speak. Jesus said, John baptized with water, but within a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. While meeting together, they asked, Has the time come, Rabbi? Are you going to restore sovereignty to Israel? Jesus replied, It is not for you to know the time or date that Abba God has established. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. 
Having said this, Jesus was lifted up in a cloud before their eyes and taken from their sight. They were still gazing up into the heavens when two messengers dressed in white stood beside them. You Galileans, why are you standing here looking up at the sky? Jesus, who has been taken from you, this same Jesus will return. In the same way, you watched him go into heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Paul, having heard Jesus, having experienced his own conversion experience on the Damascus Road, proceeded to go into the world, into the Greek speaking world of the eastern part of the Roman Empire sharing what he had experienced, confessing his own part in the persecution of the followers of Jesus. He encountered many people, and we hear in the Acts of the Apostles how he brought with him people who had been moved as he had. Maybe not with the lightning bolts experience, but people who had been converted or had experienced a movement of God upon their heart and in their lives that was so profound, so dynamic, that they could not help but share it. They could not help but enter into the work God in whatever way they could. One of those people, tradition has it, was an individual named Luke. We know next to nothing about him. <coughs> was this a, an individual of education? Was he in the school of thought that Paul had been raised in? Was he an amalgamation of different people? <clears throat> the text doesn't tell us, and even tradition itself has very little to say about his motives, why he did it, other than what we read in the page. Now, the reason I'm saying that as a preface to the rest of the hour. Um, oh, 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 oh. Thank you, <laughs> um, The reason I say that is because every time we read scripture, whether you're reading from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, or you're reading those obscure minor prophets, whether you're wrestling with the imagery of Ezekiel, or you're trying to decipher the code of Revelation. Why you are doing it is important. Luke records that I have talked with people who were there. I have sat down and listened carefully to people who had met Jesus, who were witnesses of everything that he said and did, and that all the things that he taught, all the experiences that he shared with his disciples are verifiable. It's not a collection of myths and stories and other explanations. But these were real people, Luke is saying, just like us, just like me. And everything that you have been taught, you can believe. Now, one of the things that we can learn from reading these pages 
in what we call the New Testament. One of the things that we can learn is that there are different ways of expressing what God has done in your life. That's why I ask every week, what is God doing in your life? Well, we heard two examples of what God was doing in Luke's life. Every time he opened his mouth, he was expressing what God was doing in his life. Every time that he wrote a letter, every time that he listened to what somebody else was saying about what God was doing in their life, I think as you read the rest of Acts, you see that it wasn't always pretty. It wasn't always clean. But it was always authentic. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, or Sermon on the Plain, depending on which gospel you have to read, in that that sermon, or that message, that teaching, there's a series of things to do. Love God. Love your neighbor. Be a peacemaker. A series of things that if the modern church truly embodied, there would be no decline. If every nation that had a authorized or official Christian expression actually did Sermon on the Mount, it would be amazing. But within a couple hundred years, actually by 325, the Council of Nicaea, the bishops, and the other theologians who gathered at the behest or the order of the emperor came up with a list of things to believe. Not a single one said this is what you should do. What happened to the people of the way, as early Christians were called? What happened when we went from experience to belief, to doctrine, to dogma, to institution. One of the biggest challenges facing our own denomination has nothing to do with sexuality, nothing to do with loving your neighbor, nothing to do with relationships, but it's everything centered around how to do it. We are in a time that is no more complex, no more dangerous, no more demanding than Luke's time. What caused him to write to the office? What was it about that relationship he felt it important enough to set down why Luke was following Jesus. Actually, let me correct that. Luke never says to follow Jesus. He never says, this is a person that you can follow. But he says, in his account of the ascension, this is someone that you can follow on the path that he went, the relationship that he has with his God and your God. Early Christians were called followers of the way not followers of Jesus. Now, don't mistake me right now. I don't want you to go home and write to the bishop that I'm eating heresy. What I'm saying here 
is that Jesus of Nazareth, a first century itinerant rabbi, impacted people's life to such an extent that the group of people, men and women, said, he's on to something. He's talking about a relationship with his God that I want for myself. Years later, when Luke sits down to write his account of the gospel, he acknowledges that there are other people who have had similar experiences to his. I mean, you can go to the Library of Congress, <coughs> go down to the <coughs> level, tell them I sent you, <laughs> and ask to see the early gospel records. Now, there are no extant copies of Luke's writing, but there are some from that generation after his. There are gospel accounts from Mary, from Thomas, from uh, gosh, I think I saw that day about a dozen. They all have a witness, some fact or some aspect of this life that we claim to follow and want to emulate. We are part of a tradition that says sharing what God has done, what God is doing, is our purpose. We are part of a, the branch of Christianity that says being evangelical and not in the political way that it's being used today. But being evangelical means I am sharing what God, my understanding of God. That's what I do every week, is I stand up here and talk to you about something that I have learned or heard or experienced by reading those passages for myself. That's why every Monday, I put on the blog what the scripture lessons will be that you will hear the next Sunday. And I put a link on there. You, if you don't have your Bible with you, you just hit that link, and it'll take you right to BibleGateway.com, and there's two of the dozens of versions, translations, and understandings of the scriptures. But when I'm standing up here, I am offering you what Charles Alcala thinks. I am not telling you what you have to. I am not telling you how to think. But like I told every confirmation class that I had going back to that little farming town in northeast Nebraska, I said, you as a Christian have to be a theologian. Theologian is another word way of saying someone who speaks about God. That's all Luke is doing. He's being a theologian. But he is acknowledging that he is not the only one and that his experience is instructive only to the purpose, only to the point of saying it is so much a part of who I am that I cannot help but share it. The lesson here. That's why I get up and I still get nervous every Sunday morning. I come over to the office when it's dark and I sit there and listen to the space. I come in here and kind of imagine where you'll be sitting. But I am very much aware that I 
I've been doing this for a long time now. Maybe not as long as Dan, but I've been doing it for a while. I still find it remarkable that people pay me to do this. I'm grateful that you do. <laughs> but that's not why I do it. To be a Christian means that at any moment you might be called upon to be the apologist, to be the explainer, to be the gospel that somebody else will encounter that day. I'm up here this morning not because I know more than you or my experience of God is more valid than yours. Because many years ago, I've shared this, when I was in that first pew at College Park United Methodist Church in College Park, Maryland, and I stood up and knelt at the rail at the invitation of the, the senior pastor who issued the invitation to service. Something compelled me to go forward that day. I had no idea what I was in for. <laughs> I had no idea the joys I was about to experience or the hell that I would go through. I had no idea the saints that I would encounter, the ecstasy of cantata, some not for my enjoyment, but to God's glory. Every Sunday, I get nervous, I get butterflies before I come into the sanctuary. Every Sunday, without faith. Bobby McLean, the preaching professor at Wesley Seminary, said, if you're not nervous when you stand up, sit down. That's what I want you to feel when you read these passages. I want you to hear these words that have been read and shared and pondered for nearly well, 1900 plus years. I want you to get nervous because something is moving in your heart to such an extent that you cannot help but stand up and come and kneel before your God and say, thank you for speaking to me. <coughs> now, send me to speak to others. That's the whole point of weekly worship. is not to listen to the choir, as wonderful as they are, not to hear me, not to enjoy fellowship time, as wonderful as that is, but it's to share your experience of worshiping God and experiencing God in your everyday life so that when you come into this place, you are sharing with other people who may have struggled that week to find God in the midst of their pain or suffering or every day. And to say to those, including yourself, this coming week, if you're going through a desert time, I'll be there to bring you water. If you're going through one of those mountaintop experiences, I will be waiting to celebrate with you. That's what Luke was doing that day. That's why he talked about the ascension of Jesus. If you look at the end of Luke's account of the gospel and the beginning of Acts, they're almost identical. Phrased right, slightly differently, but you get the idea. It wasn't that he changed his mind or changed how he, why he was doing it. But he was different when he wrote Acts from when he started the Gospel account. What you have heard and felt and experienced 
experience about God in the course of your life is different than when you started off. It's the same God. It's the same Lord. It's the same Spirit. But you are different. You will meet people today. You will meet people throughout the week whose experience of God is different than yours. But like those messengers said to the apostles, why are you standing staring at the sky? And when they went back to Jerusalem, to the upper room that weeks before they had hidden in fear, they remembered what Jesus said about his abiding presence and the power of the Holy Spirit that would be with them. Not just in Jerusalem, but in their hometowns, in the far reaches of the empire, to the very ends of the earth, including right here. When you leave this place, take the gospel with you. The gospel of Jesus Christ as a witness in your life and the world around you. Don't stand around waiting for somebody else to share the good news. Be the good news. Because what God has done in your life, God can do in someone else. Amen. I invite you now, if you are able to stand as we sing, I be the glory.
again for you. Go in peace to love and serve your neighbor in the name of the risen Christ and the presence of God. Amen. Amen.